Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, how about if we have everybody take their seats? Let's get the afternoon session started. Um, uh, certainly a fabulous morning. Um, but I will say this, that, uh, that one of the themes in my talk today is prediction. And I will make the prediction right now uh, that you're going to love this afternoon session. I'm, uh, I, I'm hitting, uh, let's go. Um, I'm hitting lead off, but we got a great batting order. Okay, and uh, you know, m many many of us have gone to probably you know tons, hundreds of scientific conferences, and then there's the afternoon session, and it's you know everybody's had the really good lunch, good conversation, you kind of got your mind blown this morning, and now you're kind of settling in, uh, you're getting postprandial, getting a little bit sleepy, you know, and we're, we may be even hitting a little bit of a lull. But DARPA does not do lulls, okay? <laughs> all right, you heard from Jeff this morning. We got one speed, okay, and that's all in. And we're all in this afternoon. These speakers are going to be fantastic, uh, and you're all in as well, because I know you heard some great stuff so far, and now what I need to do is get you all in on infectious diseases. So I, I'm Matt Hepburn. I am a, uh, I'm an Army physician, and I specialize in infectious diseases. And, uh, and again, I, I've devoted my entire professional career to that, to preventing, to diagnosing, to curing infectious diseases. Uh, and, and that's my passion, OK? And up until the point that I got to DARPA, my entire career, uh, I'll phrase it like this, it was all about the pathogen. Okay, what does the patient have? What's the diagnosis? Okay, they have this infection. We're going to give this antibiotics, BID for five days, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and that's, and that's, that's what I did. Okay, but the fun part about DARPA, and if you haven't picked it up already, uh, you know, you, 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 we'll, we'll keep saying this again throughout the day. We take on really difficult, important problems, and then we say we have to think completely differently about solving those. And that's what happened to me. Because for me now, it's about the host, not the pathogen. Okay, and in my talk today, I'm going to do three things. I'm first of all going to explain that to you, and, and maybe try to bring you around a little bit on that way of, of thinking differently about infectious diseases. The second is I'm going to talk so, some current examples in my, in my portfolio, as well as some really fun future ideas uh, to, to get at this issue. And the third is that this is a recruiting pitch that I want you, as you heard from Alicia this morning, we want you to help us solve our problems. And towards the end of the talk, I'm going to give you some fairly specific examples where you can pitch in. Okay? But the key question that I need you to help me solve is the great mystery, if you will, of infectious diseases. And that is, why do some people get sick and other people don't when they're exposed to a pathogen? So let's start with a historic example. This is London, 1854, the advent of modern epidemiology. The medical and public health people in the audience know this story by heart. This is cholera outbreak in London. This is Jon Snow, not Game of Thrones guy, but Jon Snow. Um, and, and it does a door-by-door -door case investigation and, and traces a common water source at a pump of where people are getting cholera. Okay, you remove the handle on the pump, the outbreak goes away. Okay, but there's an unanswered question from this example. Everybody drank the water, right? So why did some people get cholera? and other people didn't. And I want to go through a personal example where I, I had the privilege a few years ago to do an outbreak investigation with public health authorities in the Republic of Georgia in the Caucasus. And again, it was a, it was a waterborne outbreak. In this case, the infection was oral pharyngeal tularemia. Um, and uh, again, there was a dead animal in the water source, so we removed the dead, the dead animal, uh, and, and most patients recovered. But some people got really bad swollen lymph nodes, and that's what's depicted on the far left and other people didn't. So we did this case investigation, lots of interviews, all this other stuff, sorted the data, did the analysis, published the paper, and you know what we figured out in terms of why some people got sick and other people didn't? We didn't have any clue. We didn't solve it, we didn't, we didn't figure it out. So that's my point, 160 years, right? 1854 to recent times, we're not that far along on answering this question. Okay, so what did we do for the people in Georgia and what do we do for people who are coming into the clinics with infectious diseases today? We put them on antibiotics and we say, okay, we don't know why you got sick, but take your antibiotics and then we're done, okay? 
But the problem with that approach is it has unintended consequences. And we heard this morning from Alicia saying, you know, we're, we're running out of antibiotics, right? And, and the, the, this issue of antimicrobial resistance, for those of you that live this field, I mean, there's this huge sense of urgency. We have a huge problem. And I think there, you'll hear from a number of DARPA program managers and things that we're, we care a lot about this and we want to do something about it. Okay, um, I want to narrate a, a military medical example of this problem of antimicrobial resistance, and this is uh, from an operational standpoint. Um, you know, we do, Jeff highlighted this this morning, that we provide life-saving care for our soldiers when they're injured on the battlefield and when they're wounded. And uh, we get them back to medical centers in the United States. And part of that process is prolonged duration, uh, broad-spectrum antibiotics to keep them alive. But what that does is it selects for bacteria such as Acinetobacter, which I have depicted here. It's a problem. It's really hard to treat, okay? And, and we're, seeing this, we're seeing this play out in so many circumstances. And I figure we have a fundamental choice. We can keep making more antibiotics, okay? Or maybe we look beyond the pathogen. We go back to this theme of it's about the host, right? Looking at the host responses to infection. Um, certainly not my, not, it's not, oh, Matt Hepburn came up with this great new idea, it blew your mind, right? I mean, a lot of people have been talking about this, and I wanted to cite this nature, this is a recent nature review. I love this phrase, isn't that? Ditch the term pathogen, right? Think about the whole relationship between microbe and human completely differently, okay? And so, and I see this almost as a, uh, as a reconnection, if you will, between the life science community and clinical medicine. In clinical medicine, we're true with antibiotics. Life science, you know, they understand these principles of coexistence and adaptation, right? And, and tolerance, that's going to be a favorite one of mine that we're going to talk about in the next slide. Tolerance of infections. How do we tolerate these microbes? Um, one place I think we can look is, is the animal kingdom because we have great examples of pathogens that if they get into our bloodstream at extremely low doses, they're lethal. Okay, but in animal species, they may tolerate high burdens of these pathogens for a prolonged period of time. So, so why is that? But isn't that a great opportunity? And that's what I'm trying to depict for you here. If you look at the y-axis, that's your fitness, okay? So think survival. And the x-axis is pathogen burden. And what you can do is you can look either intra or within a species or inter between species and look for those types of differences. And, and you can rack and stack the, the animals um, up there. You know, for this, you may, we, we can think of this as maybe a grand negative enteric bacteria where, where mice are very tolerant of high pathogen burden, whereas human low doses in your bloodstreams can be lethal. Right? So, so what, you know, let's, let's look at that difference, right, and discover the secret code on why those animals are more tolerant. We've actually started a program in this field. It's called to, uh, technologies for host resilience. Um, and we put it out to the community and said, you know, what do you think? And, and it, we, I've had this, re there's been this really, uh, a bunch of, frankly, exhilarating moments. I've had these dozens of these conversations with animal research experts. And they've come to me and said, y you know, Matt, we, we know, we've seen this throughout our careers, this difference between species. You know, but we've never really explored it because we're not funded to do so. Most biomedical research funding for animal research is saying, make your animal as close to the human, uh, the human experience with that pathogen as possible. So you can test your drug, your drug works, okay, now you go to human clinical trials. We're DARPA, let's do the opposite, okay? And, and, and discover what's, what's special about the mice. But then, uh, again, as you heard this morning from Jeff, translate it. Right, so we discover this, but ultimately, can we modulate the host response to infection, especially in times of critical illness, especially in scenarios such as septic shock where you have that cytokine storm that's causing, your host response is causing so much damage. Can we make you more tolerant in those periods? Maybe make you more mouse-like for a short period of time, um, but ultimately to save your life. If we're going to modulate if we're gonna create that, and, and this all fits into that personalized medicine theme and everything else, um, there, there's tons of obstacles. But let me highlight one, um, and that is, um, it's not gonna be good enough for us to say, okay, the patient's in the ICU and they're sick, and uh, describing their, where they are in the time course of that infection. 
we need to be able to predict which way they're going. Is that patient on the road to recovery or is that patient getting worse? Because that's gonna affect how we modulate, right? And so it's got me really inspired with this concept of prediction. And, and there are many people in this room who are better at this than I do. We heard from Elizabeth talking about prediction and models and how that's so important in biology. And I wholeheartedly agree. Okay, but what I, I really like this idea of for that individual patient predicting if they're going to improve or if they're going to worsen, but also then can we extrapolate that across the scales of biology? Um, one example from a uh, past ARPA program was a program called Predicting Health and Disease. Uh, it was run by Jeff Ling, who used to be a program manager. Um, Jeff, uh, but the program, the, the concept was very simple. If after exposed to a respiratory virus, can you predict with host markers who's going to get sick and who's not? So pretty cool program. They've had some success. We actually have some of the performers here in the room, so if you want to talk to me or them afterwards, I can tell you all about what they found, and the challenges, and also how they've, uh, what, you know, the successes. Um, but let me illustrate another example of individual. Can we predict, back to our, our common theme, who's going to get sick, who's going to stay well um, when exposed to a pathogen? Okay, and again, this is DARPA, think about the problem completely differently. Usually when we say, okay, are you going to get sick or not, the word we use is susceptible. Are you susceptible to infection? Um, but I care about if you're resilient to infection, because we know that there are people out there that do this, and maybe they drive you crazy. Maybe they're in your family or, in their, you're in, or they're in your office or your lab, and everybody else has flu, and they're sniffling and coughing and sneezing all over each other, but there's always that one person, they're not getting sick. Why aren't they getting sick? Let's figure it out. And let's, our, our phrase for them is they're, they're the outliers, okay? And, but where we can figure that out, I think there's a huge opportunity, and I want to talk about it a bit, okay? There are thousands of clinical trials for infectious diseases that have already been conducted, okay? And, and you know that most of you are very familiar with how these trials are designed. You have your control group and then you have your treatment arm. And the idea is that everybody in the control group gets sick, right? And then hopefully your treatment, if it works, less people get sick. What about if we re-examine that control group? Because there's always a few people that are those outliers. They are resilient to that infection. They're not, getting, they're not ending up in the ICU when they're supposed to. They're, and what if we can discover what makes them special? What is that pattern? And then, let's take it a step further. What if we can then predict if that special pattern um, translates either for them or for others across, across other infectious diseases? That's what we want to do. And where we are right now is we're, try we're essentially setting the table. We're collecting clinical trials. We're working across the government and private sector. We're working with uh, uh, a person named Stephen Friend, who you're actually going to hear from tomorrow morning, uh, who's, uh, who, who's reinforced these concepts of looking for outliers in a host of different diseases, um, trying to find out what's special for them and then translate that so we ultimately make people more healthy. Okay? But then, let's even take it a step further. And let's say, what if what we learn from individuals in terms of their resilience to infection can translate into a community? Can we understand the susceptibility or the resilience um, to an infectious diseases outbreak? It's a critical question, right? Because when there's an outbreak, the people that are making the decisions for that response need to know what's going to happen. They, they don't, they can, you can tell them there's 100 cases, but what they really need to know is what's going to be the peak where is it going to spread to? What's going to be the severity of illness? All those types of questions need to be answered. And it involves predicting the future, and predicting the future is really hard. But it's a question that we care very deeply about, because we think we need to be much better at that to address the infectious diseases threats of the 21st century. So what we did to start, actually, is we said, OK, what's, what's out there right now in terms of infectious diseases forecasting capability? And so what we did is we issued a challenge in the spirit of DARPA. We said we did this in the late summer, uh, ran it for six months, so the challenge is now completed, and said, can you forecast the spread of an infectious disease? And uh, we had the, the unfortunate occurrence that chikungunya virus was recently introduced into the Western Hemisphere and, and frankly, shockingly, has over a million uh, suspected cases now reported to the Pan American Health Organization. 
mosquito-borne illness. What I'm showing you here is the distribution of the 80s mosquito in different places. You'll notice the United States has that. You know, we're on there too, right? Um, no vaccine, no treatment, severe febrile illness, uh, and, and severe joint pain associated with it. So it's a big problem. We ask the community, forecast this. Use publicly available and anything out of the other data sources that you have, and do your best to forecast. And we've, we're still analyzing the data. We've learned a ton. We're going to publish it, share it with the community. But there is one lesson learned to share with you right now, and that is no one, could really, no one did a really good job of forecasting when the disease was going to spread to a new country and when it was going to hit an exponential growth phase. That's the problem we need to solve. And one of the contentions, and I don't know if this is true, but one of the contentions that I have is that if we understand if a community has resilience or susceptibility, like certain, certain communities are going to be more susceptible to the spread of infection, certain communities may have pre-existing immunity to certain viruses and things like that, if we understand that a little bit better, I bet we can do a better job forecasting disease outbreaks. So what we're going to do is a, as a very acute next step is that we have a disease forecasting workshop tomorrow, right at the end of, of this session. And we're bringing together decision-making experts and modelers and a bunch of different people together. And we're going to talk about it right here. OK? Let me finish up on this. So when I first came to DARPA, uh, I, uh, I, had a, I had a meeting with a guy named Eric Jonas, uh, who's actually in the audience. He's actually sitting right in front of me over at my seat. So when I go back to my seat, the guy that's glaring at me is Eric Jonas. Um, he's a, a computer science whiz, OK? And so he's in my office, and a blunt guy, and said, what do you want to do at DARPA? And really, it was like, what do you want to do, do with your life? I said, I want to stop all infectious diseases from killing people. And I think, as audacious as that sounds, I think if we focus on the host, I think if we learn from the animal kingdom, and I think if we improve our ability to predict, we're going to get there. Thank you. <laughs>